Thanks everybody for being here. Um, we want to talk about the, the threats affecting EDU uh, today. And um, my name is Eric Hall. I work with uh, Code42. And if you're not familiar with Code42, you're probably more familiar with CrashPlan, which is the product that we, we invented uh, you know, 12 or so year, years ago. I worked uh, in EDU for the last 15 years, uh, mostly at Columbia University, Columbia Business School. I ran the faculty support team there and dealt with a lot of uh, recurring issues, different types of issues, type A personalities, faculty who want everything and they want it now, right? So that creates a lot of challenges with EDU as I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Is everyone, is anyone here not in EDU? I would expect everybody to be, okay, perfect. So um, the challenge with doing, doing Mac admins, they want you to talk for 75 minutes. And so in order to do that, I gotta be a little bit creative and figure out different things to do. So what I decided was that I was gonna be a little bit creative and, and go off the rails just a little bit. And so I was looking for inspiration. I wanted something where, you know, a movie or a show where somebody did a, a new product or service, uh, generate a high demand, was working in a really competitive market just like EDU. And uh, the brand value and quality was really high. Can anybody guess what I'm looking at here? If you're thinking Breaking Bad, that was, yeah, that was my initial, that was my initial thing. I really wanted to do Breaking Bad and, and crystal meth. Marketing did not like that. They thought it was a terrible idea. Don't do it. You're going to get yourself fired. Um, so I had, to, I had to do something different. So I'll give you a different hint here. And this is where we, we got to. So in general, Marty McFly, not really an EDU specific uh, subject, but the idea behind the power lacing shoes is, and so what we have here is this gentleman, his name is Tinker Hatfield, does anybody know who that is? He is the VP of design for Nike. And he started off as a Olympic class pole vaulter, uh, working under Bill Bowerman, that was his coach. Uh, the University of Oregon, if I'm not mistaken, and Bill Bowerman, along with Phil Knight, invented Nike and, and were the co-founders and presidents for a long time. He uh, broke his ankle uh, during, I think, his freshman or sophomore year. Uh, Bill Bowerman helped him out, got him into the architecture program, and he spent you know, the majority of his uh, time working with Bill, but also becoming an architect by trade. And he was responsible for creating those see-through bubbles on the side of Nike. When everybody said, oh, don't do it, why would you want to expose that, it's a risk. He wanted to go outside the box and he did something a little bit more creative. He uh, also invented the first cross trainers and he's the mastermind behind the Jordan sneaker brand versions three through 15, number 20, 23, and there might be like one or two others as well. So super important guy for Nike and uh, Phil Knight actually credits him with saving Nike because in 1986, Michael Jordan was gonna leave. He didn't wanna be with Nike anymore. The Jordan one and Jordan two sneakers were a, a debacle to say the least. They weren't really popular, nobody wanted them. He came in, he worked with Michael Jordan. He did research with Michael, he talked to him, really engaged with him. And uh, Michael Jordan showed up to the meeting where they were gonna see this new sneaker and uh, Jordan was four hours late. He was meeting with another sneaker brand on the golf course and decided, well, I don't really need to show up for this. He pretty much had decided he was leaving. Then Tinker made his presentation, showed Michael the sneakers, all the design they had done, and really went in depth into what the Jordan brand was gonna be going forward. Jordan left that meeting committing to Nike, obviously, and for the last 20 something years, 30 years, they've been a very successful brand for a long time. And uh, I know what you're thinking, what does that have to do, oh, sorry. Uh, Andre Agassi was also somebody who worked with Tinker and Tinker ended up being the person who worked with all the pro athletes designing sneakers, not just the style of the sneaker, it was really about the technology of the sneaker. How does it, how does it conform to the foot? How does it make you perform better? How does it make you um, a better athlete in general? Why did I show that Marty McFly uh, video? Because in 1989, when they did Back to the Future 2, Tinker invented the self-tying shoe, which at the time it was just people underneath the car pulling on strings to self-tie the laces, right? Um, nothing, really, nothing really great there. Um, but Tinker was the type of person who liked to make improvements all the time. And as he worked with these pro athletes over the years, he realized that a lot of them, especially basketball players in, in particular, had to tie their laces so tight their feet were being ruined. They were crushing into certain 
uh, aspects. They weren't really able to walk that well after basketball. And the sneakers really had to do more for them than just provide support during the game. And wouldn't it be great if the sneaker would adjust to what you're doing? If you're staying at the free throw line and you're not really being active, the shoe should release itself and give you a little bit more breathability, let blow flow back into the feet. But then when you go to perform the game again, they would self-tie itself and tighten up again. So in 2006, he sort of combined those two ventures and started dreaming up how they could do this. He brought in engineers and developers, learned the technology was not quite there yet for it. In 2011, as things became smaller, microchips became smaller, motors became smaller, they were able to do a little bit more and they, they started pursuing this a little bit more actively. In 2015, So nobody under Michael J. Fox, but you're gonna hear the whirling of the engine in a second. I don't really hear anything. I think maybe the, maybe the audio is off. Um, but basically what they did is they were able to deliver this to Marty McFly on the same date that he went into the future from the movie in November 2015, which I think is just incredible timing and maybe a little bit of marketing too. Um, but they delivered this sneaker to him, and what was really, just a, on a sidebar, what was really great about that is that when they actually developed the sneaker for mass production and it, to be able to put it into people's hands, they raffled off those first 300 sneakers, and all the proceeds went to the Parkinson Foundation that Michael J. Fox, you know, co-founded. So I know what you're thinking, sneakers doesn't really have to do anything with education until we start looking at what Tinker was doing year by year, and then this huge development cycle. Um, if you consider that top line would be like semester to semester or year to year in education, you're doing the same thing over and over, right? You're turning over students, you're educating them, getting them their degree and, and moving them along the process. And on the bottom there is all the research that the faculty are doing. They're looking at really interesting things. How can we change the world? How can we impact the world? And how can we make a difference? And so those things can take a lot longer, whereas the year over year turnover, you're making slight improvements as you're going. And how does, how does Nike protect itself from Tinker saying, well, Reebok's gonna offer me way more money, I'm gonna go over there and I'll bring the Jordan brand with me, I'll bring my knowledge, because he's really the, the centerpiece of the Jordan brand. Between him and Michael, they worked on all those sneakers together and they really held it together for a really long time. Um, and so how do, how do they protect it? How does higher education protect all this um, personal uh, data that they're generating, all these faculty members doing research and stuff like that. The only way to protect it is really to retain those employees. They're building their, their knowledge for themselves. They're creating a lot of data on their endpoints. They're creating a lot of um, you know, capital for the university and things that are going to continue to educate the students and also drive research. So you might have uh, employee retention policies, uh, lawyers that create patents, and that's actually the patent for the self-tying sneaker. I uh, went ahead and looked up. But in a physical world, you have to secure all of your data and your endpoints and your assets behind walls with security guards, maybe some cameras and guard dogs. And you can even go as far as to have a voice recognition box, some retinal scans and pressure sensitive floors, just in case where somebody really wants what you have access to. And that can still all be undone by a six character password because your end user doesn't want to do an eight character really crazy password. So as we go deeper into why does that tie into higher education, I'm sure those of us in the room, we understand faculty don't want a really long password. If my password is gonna be six sixes in a row, that's my choice, I'm, I'm responsible for that. And it's harder for us to enforce it, although that's probably been trending in a different direction with a lot of the ransomware attacks, with a lot of the um, data security problems that the, the world has been having lately. So I wanna pull back just a little bit and look at the business model of IT, right? Because it's more than just IT delivering sync and share products or uh, the latest MATLAB version or you know, learning management software. There's really a, a huge advantage when a university such as Columbia or anybody else has a lot of prestige to their name. You can charge more for tuition, 
you get more research funds, things like that. So when we look at the university business model when it comes to research, it's really about who's funding the research, the government, corporations, um, other entities that might give money for those faculty to pursue research, or maybe the faculty are pursuing research to get their tenure, um, but they need funding to do so. How are grants distributed? So how, are, um, how, do, how do they get that funding? Who decides who gets the funding? And then um, does the quality of research enhance the image of the university or does it, does it fall over and really you, you lose your credibility in that, in that vein? So I took that, that business model, which if you haven't seen, it's the, the Canvas business model. There's a, a really good book about it. And I just sort of transposed it here and highlighted the things I thought were most important for uh, research. And they're really the key partners all the way on the left is the government corporations, and you might get data from other sources, right? Um, and the key activity you're performing in this business model, this way that the university earns money is by performing research and you use your PhD students and other collaborators from universities around the world to perform that research. And at the end of it, your value proposition or what you're going to deliver is that your research is the best. You might churn out some Nobel Prize winners based on the research and people are gonna quote you and, and give you more money to further that research or to keep going on it. Um, and you'll deliver it through whatever publications back to the government and corporations. Any, any questions? We have the voice box here, but there's such a small room we can shut up. No? Okay. So when it comes to the education side of that business model, um, we're looking to attract students. We want people coming in, taking classes, paying tuition, using grant funds that they're getting from FAFSA or what have you to come to your school. Um, you want the best department in the country. If you have the best uh, literary department, people who want to study literature are going to go to your school and they're going to pay that extra money to go there. And then how are uh, online classes and, uh, and online degrees affecting universities? People who really can't spend four years in a university are going that way. People who want to and can are staying with the university. But those are just different aspects of that same business model with different key partners, key activities, uh, resources, and the value proposition, which ties into this discussion, is really about the prestige of the university and the faculty doing that research. If you want to know things about um, you know, uh, business, you're going to go to one of the top business schools with all the top faculty who teach business. You're not going to, you're not going to necessarily uh, go to, to community college or what have you to study those things if you're really, really interested in them or you really want to go far in your career. And that just gives you a boost in your career in general. So what are the risks to that business model? As I've mentioned, there's, there's a risk of losing prestige, right? If you have a data breach and you lose 100,000 student records, people may pause and say, do I really wanna go there if they don't take security seriously? If I'm gonna be compromised as a student or as an alumni, is that really gonna be effective for me? Now, some universities can handle it, right? Harvard had a, a data breach uh, several years ago. Columbia had a data breach several years ago. Those top universities can pay down the, pay down the problem and figure out how to keep going, but smaller schools might have a bigger issue with that. They might lose funding. Uh, there, was a, there was a recent article about uh, University of Chicago. One of their psychiatry professors was doing research and they ended up losing $3 million in grant research because of how they were handling the data or how they were handling that research. And so really without governance and stuff, you're, you're gonna have some issues. Um, with those things happening, would, would uh, enrollment drop? Would faculty stop coming there? Um, and ultimately, would you get fines from uh, FERPA, now GDPR? How are those things gonna impact the university and their ability to succeed in, in the modern day? So I'm gonna go through some, some recent examples. Um, I tried to tag these correctly so that we could, we could be on the same page, but I'm sure we're all familiar with the Sony movie hack. They were going to release a movie called The Interview. A foreign nation did not like that idea and decided they, they were gonna hack Sony and they corrupted 17 different movies, released emails about those movies related to the actors, actresses, and things like that. One of the, things, one of the big things that came out of that was the disparity, uh, disparity of female actors, actresses being paid versus males and what their retention was and, and how much they were gonna earn on that movie going forward. Female actresses were paid 7%, males were paid 9%. But those are things that, that hurt Sony, right? And it, it's for the better good, right? We're gonna, we want people to be on the same playing field. Um, but those are really embarrassing for Sony. 
And again, Sony's a really large corporation. They're able to handle these things and, and move on. But they did lose quite a, quite a lot of money from stocks and from people not wanting to work with them. And obviously the blowback with the actors and actresses was not good either. Um, that happened in 2014. That was, they called it the Guardians of Peace was the, the moniker that the hackers used. More recently, Coca-Cola uh, discovered through no investigation of their own, the law enforcement people actually brought them a hard drive that had 8,000 employee records of varying degrees of that data, right? The personal data of their employees was sitting on that hard drive and a disgruntled employee had just walked out the building one day after he'd been fired or laid off and took those records. They didn't know what he had done with them. They didn't even know that he had the records until law enforcement brought it back. So if he had enough time, it could have been sold to you know, various websites that do um, really nasty things to people. Um, so now so the Coca-Cola has to deal with those 8,000 employees, but that was not the worst one they had because in 2014, they lost 74,000 records. And what you see a lot in industry, and, and this is going to uh, either the Verizon uh, security profile they let out every year or the IBM research that's done, is that when a company gets hit with a ransomware attack or a uh, data breach, they're more likely by 27% to be hit again within the next two years. So as you think about your schools, your universities, if you have a problem with these things happening, you get targeted over and over again because once they find a way in, they just have to go so far to figure another way in once you, once you block up that hole. Um, and again, this was a former employee uh, problem that they had where the person was supposed to be destroying laptops and he didn't do it. And so they were, they were lacking some governance there to make sure that those things are being done correctly. And we'll, we'll tie that all together in a, in a minute here. This one was really, really popular. Um, a lot was done with this. And I apologize, this version is missing the date because it was sort of spanning several years. But um, Anthony Lewandowski is, is a multimillionaire now because of what he did with working for Waymo where he was a, a, an engineer designing self-driving cars. Um, he got the brilliant idea either from himself or from another company that he would leave Waymo and start his own company called Auto. And what he did when he, when he left was that he took 14,000 records with him on how to design the car and how to redesign that automated driving. The whole time he was still kind of going back and forth as he was extracting, uh, moving the files out. He was going back to Waymo and asking questions of engineers there and answering questions and, and taking it home and fixing the code and, and really plugging some holes that he had. And then he uh, waited for his investment period at Waymo so that he could get paid from stock options, um, which could have been worth, I think, a hundred and something million dollars. He quit, and the next day he founded Auto, which is a truck self-driving company. And immediately after that, Uber bought out Auto, which makes it a little bit tricky with Waymo and Uber, and that's why the lawsuit happened. Um, there was some speculation as to how involved Uber was before he quit. Um, but this intellectual, this stolen property, this stolen research that had been done and all these assets were really valuable. Um, Anthony Lewandowski received stock options from Uber upon delivery of certain technology that he was supposed to deliver. And to date, he has not done that. But three days ago, coincidentally, as I'm doing this presentation, he launched another truck self-driving car company called Cash AI. Um, trying to hide that he was really tied to it. A lot of things have been scrubbed off of LinkedIn and, um, and the, the whole site's been taken down and stuff like that. But really interesting that this guy is making a millions of dollars taking data that does not belong to him, uh, working for a company and, and thinking that I own this. Um, back in the day with Pinker, uh, Tinker, you wouldn't really do that because 70s, 80s, 90s, it wasn't really a digital world. It was more of a... Um, more of a, a hard asset type of thing, right? Um, and all the research I did for that was, was through some videos and, and, and Wikipedia, but it was really interesting to see how that, how that goes through. More specific to the EDU segment, um, in March of this year, the FBI issued uh, warrants or indictments for people, uh, I think it was nine different people from Iran who were cyber thieves who have been hitting uh, American universities and universities worldwide, stealing 30 terabytes worth of data. And most of these, uh, these uh, hacks were done through phishing attempts. They would send in you know, a number of emails, somebody would accidentally click on it, it would mirror that company's website, 
So if it was Columbia, it would be columbia.edu. It would mirror their website. The person would log in. Now they'd have their credentials, and they could go and get access to all the data that that person had access to and take advantage of all those different resources. Um, they called it the silent librarian, which I thought I found hilarious. And uh, the one thing that, that I didn't put up on here is the Iranian government says, we're not doing anything. Why would, I, why, would I, why would I hold back my research team from figuring out how to do what you're doing? And so some of these things are state-sponsored or country-sponsored, and the world that we're living in is shrinking. People have access to more data. You can get from here to, to there in a matter of seconds, and all that data is, is being published out there. A lot of what they were doing with this was selling them on different black market sites. If you want to have research on this topic, buy this article, it's here. And they were just republishing these things out into the, the dark web, quote unquote dark web. So why is higher education uh, such a big target? And these are actually, I apologize, the most uh, targeted industries are on the left here. So healthcare, higher education, energy, and small business. The thing that ties them all together is they focus way more on what they do than in protecting what they do. So healthcare, for example, we gotta save lives. We don't have time to sit and wait for security policy to be approved. Higher education, as we're all aware, the faculty need to do research. We need to move heaven and earth to make that research possible. Uh, energy, we have a, a client, um, a very major client that over one weekend had every machine in their entire company hit with ransomware. So they come in Monday morning, everything is gone. It took them three weeks to get back up and running at a loss of $60 billion. So those things are, can be avoided uh, sometimes. And we need to really hone our skills for security professionals in these type of industries to make sure these things don't happen. And, and that's where we're gonna take this conversation next. So why is higher education so uh, targeted? As I mentioned, it's, it's financial data, the grants, student loans, um, the government, the U.S. government has a whole thing about the FERPA loans and what you must be compliant with in order to keep receiving those FERPA loans. And if you uh, allow a data leak from that FERPA data, the penalties could be up to $60,000 per record. Uh, the GDPR penalties are 4% of your gross uh, profit from the year or $10 million, whichever one is greater. So that's the, the European Union, and they're going to hit hard. And it's only a matter of time before someone... Uh, a college or university here in the States gets hit really hard with those type of fines and, and you'll see that coming pretty quickly. There's also a lot of PII, things that can be resold on the dark web. If people want to hack your identity, that's really where they're getting a lot of that information from. And then uh, health and medical information, and third party research. <clears throat> so why is education so vulnerable? Uh, I'm sure most of us work either at a central university level in, in IT or we work at a sub school. Like, like I did at Columbia, where there's different departments doing different things with IT, and those sub-schools are really changing things and not really following best practices that are implemented from the central university. And that makes it really hard and really easy for hackers to figure out how they can navigate the environment and, and do different things to attempt to trick our, our end users into um, a more vulnerable state. Because of the open networks that, that EDU has, ransomware can spread really quickly. And a lot of ransomwares, um, they can sit dormant for months, um, just waiting to, to pop while they silently distribute themselves around, around your network and onto different devices. And then once they get going, it's really hard to find out where they are, where to stop them, and how to, how to uh, block these, these encryptions from happening. And it's, what's interesting, and what I've, what I've noticed over the last year, the ransomware threats, the fines used to be much higher. They used to be like thousands of dollars to get the ransomware back, and people stopped paying them because the FBI said don't pay it. So they dropped the price on ransomware to $300, and you're like, eh, $300, why not? I'll pay it, it's fine. Um, so there, there are smart people out there that are doing these things, and you can actually go on the web, and you can buy a ransomware package, and you can hand in a bunch of emails, and they'll do all the work for you. You're protected, right? Um, and that's a really scary place to be because when you have disgruntled employees, people who don't feel like they're being taken care of and they have access to all this data, they can really take advantage of that access as well. Which brings us to the next part, which is the users hold a lot of valuable data. If you think about the people who have access to your student affairs systems or your, um, your, your, all, all your student records and things like that, um, if you're not doing role-based access or if you have people who can just openly run reports, 
those reports make it onto machines that then go to bars with people after work and can be lost or compromised. And, and that's really tricky. And um, I, was, I was at a presentation um, probably the middle of last year where I said, yeah, but if, you're, if your laptops are encrypted, what's the problem? And they said, well, they're encrypted, that's great, but if you take them off network, you can certainly brute force unencrypt that machine. It's possible. It may take time, but it is possible. And so there's an there's a added level of risk there, although encrypting it means that the average Joe isn't going to do anything with that machine. They're not going to have the, the capability or the knowledge to do that. So EDU is often caught in a perplexing uh, place where you're trying the, the weight of productivity and the idea of getting work done quickly and effectively is often outweighed by the risks involved with it. Um, and I think that's where the rest of this presentation is going gonna, is gonna to focus, is on how can we balance that better and how can we uh, work with our end users to make that a much more stable environment and to protect all the data. So if we look at a, a very common security model, and, and this is just sort of drawn up, but um, this is out of a CSSP book. Uh, all of your assets are sort of in the middle, all the things you want to protect, so your end users' data, all the unstructured or structured data sitting in your databases, those things are all in the middle. Outside of that, you have a level of data security, and that might be something like um, you know, you're encrypting the hard drives, you're doing something to block off using user access control or what have you to block off access to that data, and then watch where that data goes. You might have a report that says, you know, Johnny ran this report and extracted all these student records. That might be a challenge for you. You have application security where you're preventing your uh, your applications from running Java, for example, because it's a really big security risk. Um, you might have application security where you um, you firewall off this this application. It's not allowed to talk to the outside world because it's too vulnerable, but we need it running in the environment. And you might have something like that. Then you have endpoint security. That's the encryption on the hard drive. You have really secure passwords. You might have some sort of auth token the person carries with them to be able to type into the machine and get access. Oops, sorry about that. And then obviously, as you, as you branch out, you have your network layer security. Um, what's become really popular, what they do here at the hotel, is you, you hire AT&T to host the wireless network, so you're not responsible. But then all your employees work on a private network that is more secure and less prone to, uh, to other people that don't work for you getting access to that data. And then perimeter security really focuses on those, those hard assets, fences and security guards and things like that. And what I drew across the bottom here is that your, your security governance and your policies need to work from asset out. So you need to really write governance and policies, and especially in EDU, it has to be really clear, we're writing this policy to protect this data. And in order to get access to this data, you need to have this level of right, or you need to have this permission. It needs to be granted by this person. And if you need to use these applications, you need to sign off on these waivers. Those are things that need to be hand in hand and those are things that most faculty and staff don't want to hear whenever you bring a policy in front of them and say, I'm sorry, it's policy, you must have a 12-character 12 uh, 12 password. They balk and say, okay, well, I'm going to change my character by one, one number, and I'm going to add a one at the end or something like that. Um, you know, these hackers are smart. They know people do that. They know they use the same password, um, and they're able to keep going once they gain access to your account by knowing that that's what you've been doing. So if we look back at this security model or this, uh, this business model, the one thing missing from this is uh, governance and policy. There's nothing drawn on here. And I think that's the biggest challenge for most businesses, small businesses, healthcare, uh, higher education, energy, is they're so focused on this business model. How do, we, how do we strengthen our value proposition? How do we get these things done most effectively that they're not really focused on the policies to protect that data? So. I kept the research one up here on purpose because if you were to draw a line from policy on who we work with, how do we get from our key partners into the research? How does that happen? That's really your grant writing process, how you get approved for grants. There has to be a two-way communication there. Um, how does that research happen? Those key activities, how do they work with the faculty and the PhDs? There was a, an article I read where a PhD student did a lot of work um, for a research project that was groundbreaking. And when it went to be published, the faculty member put his name on it. And that PhD student said, you know, they sued the university, they sued the person, they lost in the education uh, type of court. I, there was a special uh, consulate there for that. 
Um, and they lost. They said, no, the faculty was giving you guidance regardless of how much work you did. That faculty member can put their name on the front of it. And that person, basically, they lost millions of dollars based on that research they weren't able to, to do. So there has to be policy and governments between those interactions as well. And basically, anywhere you have an orange box, you really need policy and governance between the orange boxes to help strengthen what you're doing, what you're doing to protect those ideas that are being generated by the people who are you know, increasing the, the value proposition of your university. Any questions to dive in? So we talk about best practices, um, and this is this is sort of a, a mix of what the FBI, Homeland Security recommend, um, but really just just really good practice and, and some experience. And I'll go into some stories in a moment here. Um, you got to really work closely with your vendors and integrators to ensure security is a priority. If you're hiring a vendor and it's a really cool software and this faculty member wants to do it, but they're not really secure and it's all written in code that can be hacked pretty easily, and you don't have an overarching uh, BAA to remove liability from the university, that's a risk that you're opening up to provide that productivity. You're increasing your risk there. Um, if you're not watching threads that come through that give you all the threats and vulnerabilities, I think you guys were talking about Google Sheets being down and there was an automatic thread you guys got to say, hey, Google Sheets is down, right? That's the productivity part of your job, but there's also security uh, feeds you can subscribe to that'll tell you hey, this software, this thing's wrong with Microsoft, you gotta run updates in this OS or in this uh, application. Um, and, and I'll pause for a second to tell a story there. I, I uh, had a faculty member who I worked very closely with call me one morning um, several years ago. And it was weird that she was calling me because I managed the group. I, didn't, I wasn't really her tech anymore, but I took the call and said, oh, what's going on? And she said, Eric, it's gone. I'm like, what's gone? Your computer? Somebody broke in your office? She's like, no all my data is gone, all my credit card miles are gone, all my airline miles are gone, everything, is, I don't know where anything is, it's, it's missing. And I'm like, hold on, wait, I'm, I'll be right up, just unplug your computer, I'll be right up. So I got up there and she said, yeah, I logged into all my accounts, everything is missing, somebody compromised my account. So we had to call the FBI and the FBI came in and, and started investigating and sat me down and said, why was she still running a Windows 2000 machine? That was the worst moment of my career at, at Columbia. I just wanted to cry and I said, listen, I tried to get her to upgrade. I offered her all these machines. I wanted to do it. She just didn't want to let go. She didn't want to be inconvenienced by switching computers or switching the way that she did things. Um, from that day forward, it was no longer an option, right? We, we put our foot down pretty hard. And, um, and I'll go into some of the things that we did to, to strengthen our policy and our governance at Columbia um, and what I've seen other people do as well. Um, from your perspective, I think getting involved, being in work groups, uh, conversating with other people who might have similar challenges is really good. It strengthens your, your knowledge. And if you tie this back to those business models, um, it helps you sell the ideas upstream to your CIO. Some CIOs might not be focused on that security aspect or data backup and recovery, for example. That's really a hard sell to spend a lot of money to do data backup and recovery. But if you can tie it to a business model and you can tie it to a reason why we have to do it or we're at this risk and you assign a dollar amount, it really helps you drive that initiative and, and sell the idea uh, to your CIO or to your end users. And the last thing is really involve your end users. Um, a lot of uh, companies, not just, not just higher ed, but a lot of companies I've worked with have started being more transparent with the users. Why are we implementing this policy? Why is it important? What risk are we trying to solve? you may be losing productivity, right? You have to log into VPN. That's, it takes me three minutes. Why would I have to do that? Or I can't access what I want when I want it. That's difficult. But be transparent. Tell them why we're doing it, why it's valuable, why we have to um, lock down the environment. The training uh, exercises, letting them know what social engineering is and doing mock phishing attacks and challenging them to be aware of what's going on. Um, in, in code 42, we, we do mock phishing attempts constantly and they're annoying when you get them, you have to look at it and go, wait a second, is it, they're getting better at, at trying to trick me. Um, so I always have to pause on anything that has a link in it and say, wait, who is this from? What's going on? I forwarded off to my security officer and, uh, you know, they, they do stats on how we do. And we did stats at Columbia and the first one that went out, uh, we got a, several nasty emails from faculty. How dare you trick me? Because we didn't, we didn't just, you know, 
leave it alone. We said, when they click this link, send them to a video of our CIO saying, we got you. And uh, they were none too pleased with being tricked into feeling foolish. Um, and that was really hard for them to swallow, but we continued to do it. And our, our link rate of people clicking on those mock phishing attempts went from close to 60% to under 20%. And we just continue to do it. I'm sure they're at a much better number now. But those things really help a lot, especially when you realize that that whole Iranian hack, almost all of it was done through phishing attacks. Um, and then, you know, practice good security. Um, if you if somebody calls you, and this did happen at Columbia, and it actually happened uh, at Code recently, uh, somebody calls you and says, "Hey, I need I need access to my account." You know, question who it is. Do you know that person personally? Um, have you had contact with them? How are you verifying their identity? Is that something that could be compromised? Um, and at Columbia, I did have somebody call in and say, oh, I'm Professor so-and-so, I need my password reset. I can't access my email. And one of my texts said, you know, Eric, I got this professor. He's not here very often. Can you talk to him? I'm not sure who this guy is. Um, got on the phone. I'm like, that's not you. Who are you? What are you doing? And the guy hung up and never called back. But those are things that, that do happen in social engineering um, is getting better and better, and they, they keep trying until they find somebody who's, who's going to be gullible and, and let you through. Any questions on that? We're moving at lightning pace. We're at 38 minutes left, so I want to make sure to, to fill the time, but if you guys want to get out of here early, we can certainly power through. So what are you guys most concerned about? I think just raise the hands. Who's most concerned about? I'll start at the bottom because I, I figure it's going to reverse. So Accidental exposure of data, allowing student records to leave your environment. Who's concerned? Yeah, almost everybody. Great. Uh, insider threat, people taking data that doesn't belong to them. Faculty taking research that doesn't belong to them. Not so many, right? Academia is really open. Um, I never had a problem when a faculty member was leaving and they said, I want my data. I never had a problem just putting on a hard drive, like, here you go, man, no worries. You want your email too? I'll leave it on for 90 days. Do whatever you have to do to it. Um, and what it really comes down to in, in EDU is who owns the data, right? You're getting data from, you're getting paid to do research from a grant fund from the United States government. So that person probably has some access to that data or they should get some access to that data. The school you work for probably has, you know, demand over that data as well. And you as the person doing the research has some say in that data as well. But I think there has to be really stronger policies. And I don't, I don't know any university that I've worked with that, is, that has that yet. Um, Michigan's probably the closest. They have a 50-50 deal with the, with the faculty members that they get 50% of the proceeds from that research. The faculty member gets 50%, whether they're at the university or not. But those things uh, really need to be heavily defined. And then ransomware or malware attacks. Is everybody super two hands up with that? Okay. Um, those are getting really clever. I think the most clever one that I've run into in the last two years uh, was actually spread through Dropbox. Um, so if you as an individual had an individual Dropbox account and you were sharing documents, it actually went into your Dropbox, went out to other people's Dropbox, whatever you were sharing, and it overtook the encryption key from Dropbox. It used their encryption key to force overwrite all the files with a new encryption. And then it ripped it out and you, had, you lost complete access to all of your data in Dropbox. And then it attacked your computer and now you had no way to get it back. You had to pay them if that was really vital data. That was, yeah, yeah, so it was a phishing attack, but then it gained access through an API call to your Dropbox. So it had your Dropbox account. It ran the API locally on the machine to go to Dropbox, enable the encryption, which started a brand new refresh cycle of your data that's there. And then it passed it out through Dropbox. And then it, then it attacked your computer. So they're, they're smart and they're getting smarter and they're finding ways to get through that. Um, when it comes to the, I was hoping, I wasn't hoping, the whole Tesla thing that happened just a couple of weeks ago, as I was watching that, I was like, well, this is gonna be really good for my presentation. It turned out not to be as juicy as I hoped, um, but it was really just a disgruntled employee decided to try and steal data and embarrass the company and, and Elon Musk put a pretty, pretty big uh, stop to that. But um, these things are happening more and more, um, especially with the theft of data. I think it's, it's becoming more critical we protect our assets. A lot of companies uh, in the United States, especially, we'll call them the small companies, but there was one in particular I watched, like a 2020 article on, where the guy, he had designed wind turbines to go in the ocean. And he was working with a, a contractor in China to put these wind turbines in the, the channel um, on the border of China. And he'd been working with them for 18 months. Then they just stopped calling him back. He didn't know why. 
until he looked at like Google Maps and they were building those turbines and they stole the design from him and just did it themselves, right? Um, those things are always gonna be a problem. So how do we convince our, our faculty uh, to get through, you know, to, to allow us to be more secure? Um, really, it takes a strong hand from your CIO and from your dean's office uh, to put a foot down and say, no, we're, we're gonna do it this way. Um, I think one of the things you wanna do is, if they're trying to do something that's inappropriate or you know is not secure, is why is this important to you? Um, he's not here, but the gentleman from MIT is walking around and we had a great discussion yesterday about that because what they have is a policy and, and I told him the story about the Windows 2000 machine and he said, well, that would never happen. We have a policy. I said, well, what's your policy? He said, well, if you wanna use a machine that is no longer supported or not do an update that is required, then you have to sign off on a piece of paper that says this will not be allowed on the network. It'll be blocked off in this way. Here are the things I'm doing to reduce the risk that this patch would have fixed. Um, so essentially making a, a business agreement with that individual to take responsibility of that, of that, um, that threat. And they're able to do it in a way that it comes from the top down. So there's no decision making process. It's not between IT and the individual. It's really the policy and the individual and they can fight the policy and usually they're going to lose at that, or they can find ways to get what they need by reducing the risk. And that's really what we want to do is reduce that risk to close to zero. Uh, which is never 100%, right? It's always, there's always gonna be risk, but we wanna reduce it as much as possible. So like I said, can, th can this be done in a vacuum? And uh, the are you willing to take personal liability? Um, Code 42, I was a client of theirs at, at Columbia, and we knew we were gonna have some faculty push back and say, I don't want new software on the machine. I don't wanna back up to the cloud. I don't wanna do it. And um, we knew we'd get some pushback, but we bought enough licenses to cover everybody. And as we're rolling it out, anybody who dissented and said, no, I don't want this, they had a piece of paper put in front of them that said, that's not a problem. You don't have to do it if you don't want to. Here's the possible things that could happen to you. You could hit with ransomware. And that ransomware fine at the time could have been $1,000, $2,000, what have you. If it happens, you're not using your business account to pay for it, it'll go on your personal credit card to recover that data. We're not liable. If this thing happens, we're not liable. You can send it out to a hard drive recovery and, and you're liable for those things. We turn the liability back on them to show them why we were doing it, why it was important. And all but one person accepted the, the, the idea that we were just gonna implement Code 42. Um, so that was, a, that was a big win for us and saved us quite a, quite a lot. So I wanna ask, you know, whose responsibility is data security? All these ideas are being generated. People are generating ideas. Tinker had something he did for a movie that ended up being a shoe that is essentially gonna change the way athletics is done. The self-tying shoe in the next 10 years is gonna be the standard because athletes are gonna want that comfort, want to be able to transpose what they're doing over and over again and, um, and live better lives after the sport's over. So we would say that the, the responsibility is really all of ours, right? We all have to be responsible for data. Um, we all have to be responsible for these ideas that are being generated. We all wanna protect those ideas. The, uh, the IBM research uh, branch of their business um, did a, a really big article and they do it every year. You can read it, it's a Puna, Punam is their, their subsidiary. Um, but one of the things in there was some quotes from the security team at Uber, who after going through the whole thing with Waymo and stuff like that, they took data security really seriously. But what they said is the biggest problem is that the individual doesn't think security is a priority and they're too lax on it, they're not really focused on it. It's not something that's built into the culture of what we're doing and that's where we need to change. And that's where IT in higher education struggles because a lot of times we're still catching up to deploy software properly, right? If we're still running around with USB keys, plugging in USB keys to deploy software, how enhances our security? Probably not much, right? So a lot of, the time, a lot of times you need to step back and really solidify your IT offerings make it simple, um, make it automated as much as possible and rely on your vendors to deliver the promise that they're giving you and allow them to do their work so you guys can focus on the things that are most important, which more and more every day is becoming security. Um, this was blazingly fast and I, I apologize, but um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna end with just one, one last slide here.
Okay. So I intentionally did not mention Code 42, our offerings or anything like that. If you guys have questions about that and what we can do, you can come see me at the booth. I can stay around afterwards and answer questions. Um, but I, I hope you guys found this informative. I hope it just strengthened your desire to do security well and to make sure that your, your businesses are doing security well. Um, a lot of things are gonna happen in the next couple of years based on all the research. Um, GDPR is gonna hit people really hard. Some universities might get shut down because they can't afford the fines. Um, and it's, it's probably gonna happen over the next two years. So I would encourage you guys to do security well and I'll hang around after um, to answer any questions. Anything I can answer live? I'll just give a plus one to the uh, sort of mock phishing and security awareness training and that kind of thing. We, we in, implemented that a couple years ago. And when, we, when I first introduced it to our campus, we're a private graduate school in Southern California, um, I got a little bit of pushback from our help desk director at the time saying he'd read about a couple of schools who had done it and it did sort of turn into this us and them kind of uh, adversarial relationship between the IT administration and uh, faculty and staff. In an effort to avoid that, I tried to you know, approach it uh, gingerly, but introducing it with the training first. So we force everybody to take security awareness training once a year. Um, that's basically mandatory. Uh, I do the initial phase with sort of the, the carrot offering incentives and prizes if you finish at a certain time. After that, I do another round with the stick and say, if it's not done by this time, I'm cutting off your access to these services. Um, and it's very rarely that I have you know less than or more than 10% in that second round, so people kind of get the value of it. But in that, I mentioned the our plan to do that mock phishing attack, so they know that it's coming. Yeah. Um, and in some cases, they're like, oh, they're trying to trick me, I think I got them this time. So they're they're treating it more as a game than as sort of a uh, yeah. an adversarial relationship. So it isn't how you approach it. It's still, there's still the risk there of, you know, if you're, especially with faculty, um, they don't like to be shamed. Um, yep. They don't like to be made to feel stupid. So. You have to approach that uh, with with care as well, but it's it's totally worth it. Yep, I have a couple of universities in the Boston area that they all work together and they they share resources. Sometimes, but what they've done is they made it more of a game, where if you were the first one to catch it, or if you're one of the first fifty to catch it, you get like you know a, a credit off on your teaching load, or you get like a gift card for twenty bucks or something like that, and it's worth it because what you're giving what you're giving up to that individual is going to save you thousands of dollars later and having that awareness strengthened through all of your users. Um, what, we, what we've done, uh, what we're pushing for is a lot of our customers, when you get the, the, secure, the new security tools, is really leaving the lead, you know, having a leave behind to say, here's a new security vector we've introduced, this is how it works, these are what you can expect, those type of things, here's how we can get around what we have to do. If you want to use this, you need to be approved in this way and, and stuff like that. So you see a lot of people being more proactive with their end users, and that seems to be really successful. Any other questions? Yeah, please. History code 42, why the name? Is it's, it, uh, it is, it is. Um, so the history of code 42, if you've read the Gardens, uh, the uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the meaning of life, yeah. everything in 42. So that's the, the founders were into that book, and that's why they named it code 42. Yeah, thank you. And actually, we, we renamed from Crash Plan to code 42 because when you're selling to airlines, you cannot use the word crash plan in your, in your thing. So that's, a, that's a, a, another fun one I like to, to throw out there. Um, but yeah, we, there, there's a lot that, that we're doing um, to try and strengthen our position in security. We've really been on the reaction side of things for a long time. So crash plan is backup and recovery. Really the recovery is the piece you're paying for because backup is useless if you can't get your data back. And we've been doing that really well for a number of years. This year, we added a lot of security features where we can tell you if uh, you get hit with ransomware, your machine, and we get the MD5 hash of what caused the ransomware, I can tell you in three seconds every device that exists on or has ever existed on your environment. So it's pretty cool stuff. And we're, we're really digging our heels in on the security aspect of things. And I think um, just after our initial launch, we already won a couple different security awards for these different things that we're adding to our product. Um, that still ha exists off of one endpoint agent, which is great. Um, not a lot of people can say that. So, yep. Any other questions? I will give you 24 minutes back in your life. Uh, I apologize for being really fast. I'm from New York. I talk fast. So I appreciate you guys coming out. Thank you very much.
and I'll, I'll hang around if anybody has any other questions or wants to wants to just talk.